Hi, welcome to our online experience. My name is Jordan, and I have the privilege of serving as lead pastor here at Newport Mesa Church. And we're just super grateful that you are tuning in and you're allowing me to come into your home. Typically, it's the reverse, and we're getting used to this new way of doing things. Hopefully, it doesn't last too much longer. I want to introduce you to the really the mission philosophy of our church, and that is our desire to see you grow with your relationship with Christ. That is our hope. And in fact, we've created five questions that we're going to uh, give to you at the end of this message that will allow you to process the message and apply it to your life with your friends, your family, uh, maybe your neighbors. And, uh, and that's our hope is we want to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And uh, that's our desire for you. I want to just say also a special thank you to everyone in our church family who has been serving, helping uh, get food to hungry people, giving, caring for your neighbors. It has been amazing to see the growth that I have physically witnessed in our congregation uh, and the heart of God that is just uh, coming out of you. And I'm just so grateful and proud of you. Well, we're into a new series this week. This is week two of The New Normal. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. We're going to be talking from the topic of no pain, no gain. And uh, I got to tell you, change is not easy. Uh, it's painful. It's not something that people enjoy. I don't enjoy it. But we know that God can use change to change us. And one of the things that I'm kind of already sick of is technology. I'm just going to be honest with you. Is, it, is there anybody else out there? I was talking to a friend. They said, I'm so sick of Zoom calls. Um, I appreciate technology. I love that, that, that God has used this. In fact, we're actually going to have in a couple weeks a message on technology and how we want to leverage it for God's kingdom. But man, I'm just looking forward to seeing you in person. I'm looking forward to that. Anyone else out there? This COVID-19 situation has just forced us to think differently in a lot of different areas, um, in our school, in our marriages, in our families, our friendships, in our walk with God. How, is, how has this situation changed for us, our jobs? Uh, we already talked about church, but Man, what are we learning in this season? Where are we growing? What needs to be left behind and what can we embrace for the future that God has for us? I am convinced that God uses all things for our good and his glory if we just sink into this season and embrace it for what it is, embrace the change that God wants to bring. I want you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 20. This is the very last week of Jesus' life. And to be honest, I started thinking about this passage the week of Easter, and it has really impacted me, and I just believe that God has a word for you today. This is what it says in verse 20 of John chapter 12. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So again, this is in preparation for the Passover. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. You know, all these people are hearing about the miracles, and they want to see what's going on with this rabbi, teacher, miracle worker. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and this is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus says to them. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I want to pray for you right now, just that the Holy Spirit would plant something in your heart as he's planted it in mine. Father, I pray that you would speak to us today. We know that you are speaking and that you speak through your word. And so, Father, even as I have prayed, I pray that the truth of your word would sink deep into the hearts of your people. Lord, let there be all sorts of people who hear your word and respond today. Somehow, Father, people from California, people from throughout the United States, people from other countries, Lord, this is for everyone. So, Father, I pray that you would speak in Jesus' name. Amen. A new normal means death to an old normal. I want you to understand, this is the last week of Jesus' life, and the disciples and Jesus for the last three years have gotten used to a certain way of doing things. 
The expectations for a Messiah have grown in the disciples' hearts, in their lives. In fact, the triumphal entry is an example of what people expected to welcome in a victorious king, a conqueror who would come and take on the Romans. And yet Jesus is doing things differently. First, Jesus is responding to Greeks being included in this conversation. You might be thinking, but the Jews were the chosen people. And trust me, this was a very difficult concept for the Jews to overcome. In fact, if you follow this uh, gospel unveiling through the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on God's people, it doesn't totally eradicate some of the discrimination that the Jews had. Peter still, even long after he is ministering, still doesn't quite understand that God came for all people, that Jesus loves all people, that there is no boundaries on his love. And Jesus is responding to this, this by specifically saying that his death is not just for the Jews, but it is also for people who didn't worship at the temple. Maybe they were Greek, maybe they in today's world, maybe they're born in a different continent and they have no idea what Judaism is. Jesus is for you. This is a new normal. Jesus is also specifically talking about his own death. This is probably the hardest thing for the disciples to grasp. Here we're talking about a king, a Messiah figure, and who in the world as the king would give up his life for his own people. But this is literally what Jesus intends, to give his life as a ransom for many, helping put to death the old normal of sin, to put to death all of the ways that we have misrepresented and deformed God's image in this world. Jesus would die for all of those areas of aberration. Jesus knew that it would require his very example to set the pattern for transformation in our life. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's setting the example and showing us what this true path of transformation looks like. I want you to look at verses 25 and 26, where he literally has these, uh, these ways of doing things juxtaposed. If you want glory, you've got to suffer. If you wanna be honored, you've got to serve. If you wanna bear a lot of fruit, you've gotta be planted. And it's just this different way of thinking about how life works. Jesus is redeeming pain, but no gain, no pain. And if there's no pain, there won't be any gain. This is the way of putting the old away and embracing the new. I gotta be honest, this is just something that this is literally how it works in our human lives. We learn, we grow, we develop, we put old normals away and we embrace new normals. One of the things that Harper used to do, oh my goodness, it still makes me laugh, but I would, I would put her up on the changing table and uh, she was old enough to talk and she would say, no, 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 my poopy. And I'm sitting there changing my daughter's diaper thinking if you were 20 years old, you would be mortified by this story. So please, let's just cut this little story out. We'll keep it. We'll save it. We'll play it at her wedding. She'll kill me, but it'll be amazing. I'm just so glad though that Harper has learned that pooping her pants and keeping that poop in her pants is not accepted in our society. And, uh, and I'm gonna be honest, I know her future husband will appreciate this. Albert Einstein said this, doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and expecting different results is literally the definition of insanity. This is the crazy thing. There are things that we want to see God do in our lives and we're trying to figure out how to get those results, but we're not willing to change anything to get them. Uh, when I used to work in Alaska, there was a tree that made up a lot of the forests in that geographical area. It was called the lodgepole pine. Now, something interesting about the lodgepole pine and the way that, uh, that, that Alaska and, and the forests worked up there is they would have these big forest fires. Now, some of us are, we freak out when we hear about a forest fire, you know, especially when it's human started, but forest fires are a natural part of the way the world works. And if it weren't for forest fires, the lodgepole pine would actually uh, become extinct because what happens with the lodgepole pine is the pine cones where the seeds are uh, stored actually are, are not able to get out of the pine cone unless heat is applied and melts the resin that has the pine cone, 
<laughs> the pine cones and the seeds locked in. In fact, it takes a forest fire and, and, and a temperature of 113 degrees all the way up to 140 degrees for those pine cones to open up and for the seeds to fall. And friends, I, I'm just believing I don't care if it's man-made, human-made. Uh, it doesn't matter what the origin of this pandemic is. I believe that God uses all things, all change for our good if we're open to what God wants to do. This pandemic is forcing us to change. It's forcing us to think about what needs to die so that something else can be birthed and a new normal can become our new normal. So I want to ask you that very specifically this week. What is the thing that needs to die in you? What's the thing that needs to die in me so that something else can be planted? Let me throw a couple things out there. This is just me, and, and you might even just in this moment respond, you know, whether or not it's in your text thread or you've got your journal out, you're in your jammies, so maybe it doesn't matter. You can just, you know, get up for some coffee, get your notepad, but I want you to actually process with me. What are some of the things that you don't want in your life anymore? Let me just list a couple for me. I don't want pride in my life. Pride has not worked for me. I don't want envy in my life. Envy has not worked for me. I don't like looking at other people wishing I was them. Gluttony has not worked in my life. And gluttony is not just about food. It's about excess, consuming more than I need. It just doesn't work. Lust does not work. Lust is not going to help any marriage. Anger is not working for me, right? Greed is not working for me. Sloth, these are just seven, uh, you know, we call them the seven deadly sins. There's probably a bunch of other things. I want you to identify this week. What is not working for you? If we're not able to get rid of something, it might be hard to bring something else in. And I want you to think about this concept or this idea to swap something out that isn't working for something that will work from you. See, all of those things have stolen from you, but God desires there to be values in your life that will give back life to you, that will build your marriage, build your kids, build your career, and especially build your walk with God. So what are these new normals? What are these new values in this season? This last week, I had a conversation with Coach Margaret, and uh, we actually interviewed Margaret on Monday night. We had some tech difficulties, so we ended up posting it on Tuesday night. Uh, but we were talking about gratitude. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking with Margaret. She's a professional um, business and professional coach. Uh, th this last week, we talked about gratitude. This next week, we're going to be talking about giving. And, uh, you know, we've just been having this, this conversation where we process what how is this change impacting the, the, the new normal habits, these new normal mindsets and paradigms, ways of thinking that we want to embrace? Uh, specifically, we talked about gratitude again, and our thought process was this. How can we grow in gratitude for my spouse, for my kids, for my family? As we're navigating these COVID-19 uh, pressures, how am I growing in gratitude for my job and my career, for my church and my church family, for my freedoms as a U.S. citizen? If you're from the U.S. or if you're from another country, what is it that you value about where, you're, about where you live? You see, there's a mindset that needs to be changed and something that we've grown up doing and maybe we just have gotten so used to complaining and another way of doing things and we haven't been open to changing and, and embracing a new habit for a new season for different results so that we don't get stuck in these cycles of doing things the same way and wishing that we had the fruit of this thing that's over here, but we're stuck in this habit back here. So what are the new normals that you're choosing in this season? Another one of the habits that we've started doing is every day at 7 a.m., our church has gathered on Facebook, on social media, for a 15 to 20 minute focus on scripture and prayer. We've built this scripture meditation practice in our life. Something that my family has done is we have, we've gotten one of those sourdough starters from our neighbor, and now we're making sourdough bread. I don't know if that's good for all the keto people out there, but... Man, sourdough bread with butter coming right out of the oven. Oh, it's amazing. I'm just telling you. Then she made scones yesterday. So there, again, there's some new normal habits that may not be so good, but I, it just, I'll let you 
figure that out for yourself. Maybe you have a new workout routine that you've been doing. I, I've seen some of you guys doing your thing, doing your little workout thing, and honestly, I'm impressed because I haven't worked out in like two and a half years, so I look up to you. I'm trying not to envy you, but I do look up to you. Uh, maybe you've been more connected to your friends and your family via the phone. Maybe you've cared more for your neighbors in the last couple weeks, maybe than you ever had. You didn't even know their names, but now you know their names, you know what their needs are, you know what they're struggling with, and you know how you can pray for them. Maybe a new habit that you've developed is family dinners. Hey, everyone's in the home. Why don't we eat together? What, a, what an amazing thing for the family to gather around the table and to spend some time talking about what we're so grateful for. Maybe it's just been a different pace of life. Do we really need all the extra activities? Do we need all the extra flurry and frenetic energy? Maybe we can settle into a different way of life. Here's the reality. Whatever new normals we're choosing in this season, I want to encourage you to have patience because there are no shortcuts in this life. This applies not just to our spiritual lives, but it applies to every area of our lives. The only way to kill sin or these old normal habits is death to self. And friends, this is not easy. It is a path that requires a season of commitment and more realistically, seasons, plural, of commitment. If you want to experience the glory, you've got to suffer. If you want to experience the honor, you've got to serve. If you want to bear the fruit, you've got to let God plant you. And I know you may feel right now, right where you are, like you're in a very, very dark place. You might even be saying, you know, you're, you've got a positive way of looking at this, Jordan, but I'm just not there. I'm buried. I'm depressed. I can't survive this. I'm all alone and no one can reach me. Maybe you're saying, I'm just so sick of Zoom. I miss my friends. I don't have a graduation ceremony. And friends, there are some, there are some real things that we are truly mourning in this season. And I am not trying to minimize actual grief, actual loss. And, and, and some of these things that we're processing. I don't think you, I don't think, any, and I'm bad with this, I don't think any of us can just stuff. It's this process of, of getting rid of the old and embracing the new. It's, it's, a, it's a journey, it's a process, but I wanna encourage you to, to not give up because what you are feeling may not be an accurate reflection of your spiritual reality. I want you to consider this. There's a, a preacher by the name of Christine Kane who says, you think you've been buried, but actually you've been planted. And I can't think of a better reflection of this passage than what she said. I've got uh, a fruit here that I brought and many of you know, maybe you don't know, that I am actually from the state of Washington. So I've got an apple. Where do you think this apple was grown? California, of course. I mean, where, where else could it be from? But this is an apple my wife brought home the other day and I cut up another apple. Again, I've got a nice crinkly bag here. And um, I pulled out one of the seeds of that apple. Now, I don't know if we can get a close-up. Probably not, so we're not even going to try. But we've got a tiny little seed here. It's literally barely the size of, you know, it's just so tiny. I don't even know if you, it's like a speck. And then you've got this apple here. So you've got a seed and you've got an apple. And sometimes we just think that, you know, when we give our lives to God or we say, yes, I want Jesus to be my new normal or yes, I want gratitude to be my new normal or I want to be thankful and I want love and I want joy and I want peace and I want patience, right? All of the fruit of the spirit, all of the characteristics of God that I desire in my life but I forget that the process of the seed to the apple is quite a journey. And it's never a simple line from seed to apple. Why? Because if this seed were to grow, it actually doesn't even become an apple. A seed becomes a tree and a tree bears fruit. Now, the, the, the time it takes for a seed to become a tree and for that tree to bear fruit just depends on the kind of tree it is. Um, one of my favorite kinds of trees in this world are avocado trees, which are plentiful here in Southern California. I love avocados, but it takes a while to get an avocado tree to grow from, from that bigger seed it is 
to the point where it's actually bearing fruit and then you've got to have a male tree and a female tree. There's all these different factors. The reality is it takes seasons for a seed to get into the ground for it to grow and for it to become a tree and for that tree to bear fruit. It's amazing to me what happens with Jesus' life. If you just look at the life of Jesus, he spent 30 years on light, on earth as a human. His ministry doesn't even start until he's 30 years old. I want you to just think about that. He spends 30 years investing, and we don't even really know. He's living his life in Nazareth. At some point, he moves to Capernaum, and then at 30, he starts to invite people to follow him, these fishermen, these tax collectors. And for three years, he's traveling from town to town in northern Galilee. He's doing miracles. He's teaching. He's being patient. And for three years, he's pouring, he's pouring his life into these men. And they're thinking that this thing is just going to become this amazing tree, march right into Jerusalem, and Jesus takes over. And no, 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 Jesus stays the course. He says, unless I am glorified, lifted up. You see, God has a different definition of what glory entails. Glory is the suffering servant on the cross, dying for the sins of all people so that their sins can be atoned for, their sins can be covered, and so God can have relationship with them again. And there's no shortcut. Jesus knows that in this last week of his life, that his life, this very seed, is going to be planted as he is hoisted up on this cross, as he suffers for the sins of humanity, as he dies and takes his very last breath, as he's planted in a grave, for three days, Jesus was totally dead. And on the third day, he rises again. And what has happened in the course of history over the course of the last 2,000 years, from the moment Jesus rose from the grave and for the days that he showed himself to his earliest disciples and then he ascends into heaven and then the Holy Spirit descends into the hearts of all people who call Jesus Lord as this tree has grown up and become this amazing, huge, fruit-bearing tree where the birds of the air come and find shade and fruit is born. The world has tasted and seen over and over and over in every pandemic, in every season, in every disease, in every natural disaster, that it's Christians who rise up to stoop down and to serve, to love people right where they are. And friends, nothing will grow your spiritual maturity faster. Nothing will create love, peace, patience, kindness, joy, all of the things that we desire more of, all of these things, until we realize that the way that that all happens is death to self. It's death to self. And there's no shortcut to death to self. If you want to get rid of old ways of doing things, if you want to get rid of old normals and embrace a new normal, the new normal of Jesus and the new normal of what God can do in your life, you've got to say, God, I have had enough and I need you to help me. I need you to do something big in my life. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine named Alex. He was in a season of his life where he recognized he needed a change. And God was so graceful, he met him right where he was. And the process of transformation in Alex's life, it's still happening. I want you to watch this video. Hey guys, my name's Alex. And I just want to share a bit of my story with you guys. My story actually starts out here in Newport Mesa. I'm 25 now and I grew up in this church. I grew up running through the hallways. I grew up actually with my mom working here in the ECC. I've been to every program, whether it's uh, starting out as a baby, a bunch of people will change my diapers that know me now as a grown adult. And they're like, hey, you're Alex, you're Bev's son. I used to change your diaper. I'm like, wow, that's a really strange way to say hello to someone. My name's Alex. I don't know your name. Uh, but I grew up going through all the programs and being in the church, but not being a part of it. 
And as I grew up and uh, started high school, my faith had this moment to either go on forward as my own faith or really, uh, really just kind of fade away. Uh, I either had to, you know, be a faith, uh, a relationship that's mine, um, or something that just my parents did that I was a part of. And so at this moment in high school, I realized that this relationship with God wasn't really something that I was interested in. My parents followed God, my mom worked at the church, but I never really had this personal, intimate relationship with God, and I stopped going to church. And from then on, time and time again, uh, I started to struggle more and more with things like anxiety, things like depression and suicide. And uh, the further and further away I got from the church, right, I stopped going to Sunday services, stopped going to youth group, uh, really started to seclude myself from those people who would really pour into me. Like my friends started inviting me to church. I'm like, I can't go that day. I've got to wash my hair. I'd really just do anything to really not go to church. I have a million and a half excuses why I shouldn't be there or why I couldn't be there. Uh, but it was weird because I had this duality where I knew this hope, right? I'd grown up in the church. I'd heard all these stories of, um, of God and his goodness. And I'd seen him show up in other people's lives. And in reality, I saw him show up in my lives, but I decided no, it wasn't for me. And I stepped away from the church. I stepped away from those friends who were trying to get me to the church. I stepped away from the youth group. I stepped away from all of that and started to live this lifestyle that wasn't Christian. Uh, as I went to college, I started drinking, started smoking, uh, started living this life that absolutely wasn't Christian with these relationships that weren't uplifting to God or in reality weren't uplifting to myself in any way. And the further and further I got into this lifestyle, the further I or the further away from any light I saw in my life I got. I saw uh, this kind of this sad darkness of life where uh, the friends I had were uh, you know, my mind, oh, I'm not as bad as them, right? I'm not doing the things that they're doing. I saw like the lifelessness that they had. And I always had this duality of uh, where I saw, you know, I saw these Christian friends, right? I connected with them a little bit uh, as I grew a bit older. And I saw the hope that they had in Jesus. I had grown up in the church seeing all these, um, or seeing and hearing all these stories of God's goodness. And I knew them to be true. I knew that there was a God who loved me, but I guess I just really didn't care. And so, the further and further I got into this lifestyle, I really started struggling more and more with depression. I started struggling with purposelessness. I started just feeling like, if this is life, like, how, like what's the point? I'd see how other people are living, uh, who, who I thought, you know, like, okay, these are my friends and they're living these uh, lifestyles similar to me, but how are they having any hope because they, they are living these crazy extravagant lifestyles and outside of God, but like they're still happy kind of. But as I got to know them a bit more, I realized that none of us were really happy. I realized that all of us were trying to fill this void. All of us just kind of felt like this darkness inside of us that either, you know, you acknowledged and started to struggle with depression or you just tried to run from or fill it up or, you know, went to the next high to, um, to really just get away from that, to escape from that feeling. And eventually for me, it got to this point where I knew the reality, I knew of God, I knew the story, I knew the Bible, but I didn't have this, I never had this personal relationship with him. And I got to the point where I just felt this overwhelming sense of, I can't keep doing this. I struggled with it time and time again, where I'd feel like this, this moment of God calling me closer. I'd felt, uh, I'd start to read my Bible because I knew this is what I should be doing. I'd start to attend church a bit more, but something would pull me away. And it was this year long constant battle of back and forth, back and forth of, uh, finding life in Christ to find this, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. But then realizing, no, that's not what I want to do. That I wanted to live this lifestyle. I'm comfortable in this. I'm comfortable, uh, doing this. I don't have to worry about being wrong or right? I can just be me. But the reality is being me just was sad. Uh, the lifestyle that I wanted to live was one uh, that was destructive, not only to myself, but to those around me. And eventually, uh, it was January 1st, funnily enough, um, the start of 2017, uh, I, I woke up after just, uh, honestly, just a night of partying and realized this lifestyle isn't the lifestyle I wanted to live. I had felt this call of God in my life. I had felt uh, like God has been like, hey, you're my son, I love you. I want you to be a part of my family. I want to be your father. And I had felt this, this yearning for this lifestyle that was different, but back and forth, back and forth, this internal struggle for a year. And finally, January 1st, 2017, I, I finally was like, okay, like there's something to this. I, I know that God has been calling me. I know that there is a God. I know that there's a life that's completely different than what I've been living and maybe there's hope in that. So come January 1st, I actually attend uh, service here in Sanctuary uh, and it was all about recalibration. 
And I thought, I was like, how fitting is it that I lived this year, uh, this, you know, however many years of sinful lifestyle outside of the church, living in darkness, living this life being completely separated from God, uh, living completely stuck in darkness. And now my first Sunday back, it's talking about recalibrating my life towards God. And in that moment, I realized, okay, this is really what I've been waiting for. This is really what I've been known to be true, but I've been running from my entire life where there was this lifestyle of hope that was out there, but I just wanted to live the way I wanted to. And looking back, it's kind of crazy knowing both sides, growing up in the church, but not of it, and choosing to step away from the church and being able to see kind of the juxtaposition, the contrast, of this lifestyle of death and destruction where it's just filled with a lot of false hope. And then finally encountering Christ, right? And now living this lifestyle where it's just complete freedom, but that freedom is in God. It's like day and night. It's two completely different lifestyles that looking forward, I can't imagine ever going back to this lifestyle where I don't live for God. I can't imagine living this lifestyle where I'm not living as a son of God and finding my identity in Him. Isn't it awesome to see what happens when we say, God, I need a change. I need you to bear fruit in my life. I want to commit myself to you. I want all that this life has for me, but I know that it starts with dying to myself and finding Jesus, following Jesus and learning from the master how to get down on my knees and serve someone, to love someone right where they are. I am inspired by Alex. And friends, I gotta tell you, it's been an amazing journey just serving alongside of him as he's a part of our tech team and he's doing youth ministry. It's just so cool to see the process of growth and transformation in Alex's life. He is bearing fruit and there's nobody that can deny that. And it's been awesome to see. And God can do that in your life. God wants to bear fruit in your life. And friends, the gospel is simply this. As long as there's a seed, and a seed is so little, but as long as there's a seed, there's a hope for a future. As long as you allow this tiny, little, small seed to be planted in your heart, there's hope for a future and there's hope for fruit to come in seasons of growth. God can do an amazing thing in your life if you give God a chance. One of the cool things about the book of John, starting in John 1, is, is that John compares Jesus to the Logos, the eternal word of God. And this small seed is compared to the word in scripture. So I wanna encourage you to invite the eternal word of God, Jesus, into your heart so that God can grow you into an amazing tree that can bear fruit for all people to taste. God is so good and he's the one that makes the growth happen. I wanna invite you to say this simple prayer if that's where you're at today. Father, I've had enough of these old, normal ways. And I know that for me to experience the new normal, I need to say, enough is enough, I need you. Death to self. And so Jesus, we declare today that we will follow you. We accept your forgiveness. We believe that your death on the cross was for us. And we choose today to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So grateful that you've tuned in today. I want you to know that we've got a couple questions there for you to process. Again, the five questions. And uh, we've got all sorts of spiritual content that we're pumping out during the week. And we'd love to participate with you in that. This is a journey and it's a journey that our community gets to go on together. And it actually, especially right now, it doesn't matter where you're from, you can join this faith journey with us. We'd love for you to join with us this week. God bless you. We want to thank you for joining us today. Here at Newport Mesa Church, we're all about changed lives. If this message encouraged you, we'd love to hear about your story. Connect with us on our webpage or email us at info at newportmesa.org. If you'd like to support the ministry here, you can give through our website or our mobile app. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you next week.